Hi, and welcome to Raw Mission, the podcast where we bring you challenging and inspiring stories of ordinary folks sharing the good news of our extraordinary God in some of the toughest parts of the world. I'm Matt, your host for this podcast, and to introduce myself to you, in this episode I'll be sharing some of my story, taken from an interview earlier this year with my good friend Simon Gilbo. Simon is a popular author and speaker, a fourth generation missionary to Burundi, and the founder of Great Lakes Outreach. He hosts a podcast called Inspired, and has kindly given us permission to use the episode where he interviewed me. We discuss earthquakes, terrorism, and gospel opportunities from the years I spent living and serving in Pakistan. Welcome, everybody. This is Simon Gilbo with Inspired. It's great to be back for another week with another fantastic guest. We're not going to give his full name because of some of the work he's involved in, which you'll come to understand, but his name is Matt from Frontiers. Matt is an old mate, and we weren't at school together. We were at uh, rival schools. In fact, uh, my cricket season was ruined by his school. I got a beamer and a cracked rib from it, so there's a bit of latent bitterness there. But Matt, I, one of our funny memories that I think of was the, we were on uh, a, a Scripture Union house party, and I had recently read a book. What was his name? It was some Russian guy who had, under the Soviet Union, had been persecuted, and they took him out pretty much butt naked for hours on end in the Siberian snow. And he, the Lord just met with him and he survived and the guards just couldn't believe it. And we were both super hungry. We were probably actually helpers by that stage. It was called senior campers, maybe 19, 20 years old. And we really wanted to go out and express that same kind of hunger before God and experience that. And it was Easter. It wasn't even Christmas time. So it was cold, but it, well, it was obviously cold because we said we're going to stay out as long as possible and pray for the gift of tongues. And so we we're out there praying, Lord, come on, Lord, we're hungry for you, more of you. Come on, Holy Spirit, touch yeah. us. And we lasted about 40 minutes and we were so <laughs> cold that we came back with our tails between our legs. And it, it didn't happen then, did it? But anyway, the Lord has met with us power, powerfully subsequently. Anyway, Matt, that's enough of me. Uh, welcome, bro. It's great to Thank have you. you. Why don't you just give a, a bit of context from your background? Yeah, hi Simon. <clears throat> it's a it's a real privilege to be with you, Simon. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I didn't grow up in a family like yours, where if I'm if I remember rightly, Simon, you know, you've got parents and grandparents who love the Lord and love serving God in the nations. My family background was a bit different, just very nominal Christian home, so no one really followed Jesus at all. And it was only actually uh, when my my brother came to faith at school and then myself at about 16 years old. And then my younger brother came to faith as well at school. And then my mom and dad a couple of years later came to faith too. So we sort of became a Christian family in a Christian home, uh, which is awesome. I just thank God for that. He loves families, doesn't he? Um, but yeah, that's my sort of background. Came to faith at 16. Um, and then, yeah, and then it sort of my faith really actually took off. Just I think it was that same year when I met you and we had that crazy prayer time that we gave up on pretty fast I think it was that same year I went off on a gap year to India traveling um, and that's where God really got hold of my life and I and I had to make a big decision like do I want to center my whole life around Jesus or not um, and, and the decision was yeah I've got to he is everything often those gap years are sort of just pure dossing around the world type experiences yeah. did yours have a more specific focus yeah it did well certainly it did in, in my mind I remember I was such a, a baby Christian didn't really know what it was to walk with Jesus but I did pray this little prayer having seen my brother come back from Zimbabwe his faith alive on fire for God and I thought okay I want to do a gap here and I want it to be something God where I really connect with you and, and my faith takes off too so I remember praying really basic that little scripture commit your plans to the Lord and they will succeed and I just committed my gap here to God and I ended up I ended up in India to be honest, it wasn't a very spiritual gap here. The guy who ran it, I think, was a bit of a crook, to be honest. And huh. certainly the villagers in India said that he was fleecing all the money off us, taking it himself, and they got nothing, which wasn't the idea. But we we have had basically five months traveling around India, teaching a bit in the villages. But for me, it it God really answered my prayer because I don't know, I took books, folks on that, on that um, yeah, that house party said to me, like, it's gonna be make or break your gap here. So so go, you know, go and take some key books. I remember reading some powerful books. And also out of the 16 students that I was traveling with, I think four or five of them came to faith. Not, not through me. I'm no great evangelist, but they just borrowed books I had. And we met some Pentecostal Kenyans out there who just prayed for us and saw some really cool word, word of knowledge kind of happening. And they, mm -hmm. they led some of our gang to faith. It was a really amazing time. 
You say you're not a great evangelist, but it was interesting enough, last Sunday, actually two Sundays ago, the church warden stood up and shared his story, and he talked about being at Durham in a bar and someone coming up to him and quizzing him. And uh, you'll know who that was. That was our mutual friend, Alexander. So he came to faith for you. So that's an encouragement, isn't it? That that was a major encouragement. I'm not quite sure to this day how it all happened, but God was at work in him. I just happened to be there, I think. Brilliant. So lessons learned from that year out? Yeah, for me... It was a powerful time because I think I, I knew about God and I'd received his forgiveness in a sense. I'd prayed a basic prayer, but out there, I, I realized if you give your whole heart to God, you get so much more back. And you know what it's like to you. And you get away from that kind of lifestyle. If you've been caught up in a not very healthy lifestyle, as I was as a typical teenager in the UK, that break made a big difference for me to kind of, obviously I was changing friendship groups anyway, going up to university, but just giving myself to the Lord out there made a huge difference, but also opened my eyes traveling in India. India's crazy, isn't it? It's, mm. it's an assault on the senses in every way. You've got, you know, Hindu temples in front of you, you've got sights and smells and sounds and beggars and people pulling you and crazy stuff happens. And it's a really good time to just think, what is life about? Yeah, just let me tell you this funny story, because my wife, you probably don't know this, Lizzie, she was born in India and uh, her parents oh, met so. out there on the mission field. And this is a tribute to my father-in-law, David, I'm sure you're listening, because David went out there as this high Anglican, whatever they were, whichever society, and and he met his future wife at uh, language school, and she courted him through Romans, because he went out there essentially to do good works, didn't have any sort of saving faith. And a visiting speaker came uh, to the college, and he was talking to Reverend David Korff and said, uh, so David, do you actually know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And David said, do you know what? I don't think I do. <laughs> and so, so my father-in-law, as a missionary in India, came wow. to know Jesus out there. So that's hilarious. Anyway, that back to you. Yeah, I mean, it was a hugely formative year for me, not just feeling like God showed up in a number of ways in my own life and seeing the miraculous a little bit, um, but also... Uh, that's where my love of South Asia started and people from South Asia, just so many, you know, if you're in India, you see the millions and millions mm. of people, crowds and crowds and mega cities and slums and everything. And if you can't catch a heart for people, to be honest, I'm not super compassionate. I'm not one of these like inspiring guys who just has this deep compassion for people that, but you know, if you're not going to be touched at all by, by the lost and the, and the, the lostness of the crowds and let alone the poverty in a place like India, then, then we got issues. And I remember, I remember even praying, Lord, yeah, just open my heart, give me that kind of fountain of tears in my heart, as mm. Jeremiah prays, because I need that. That's not my natural gift. I'm like my wife, who's super compassionate. But I did develop a love for South Asia and and just the craziness and the, even the adventure, some really, you know, some really kind of carnal things. I just love the craziness, the travel, the adventure, yeah. and all of that. And I think God started weaving that into my story. Um, and, you know, and as you'll see, as it sort of developed into spending, I suppose, nearly a decade of my life out there in South yeah. Asia. Yeah, I think we're wired very similarly, actually. And also, my year similarly before going to university was absolutely critical in the shaping of me. So maybe that's a big recommendation to those listening with uh, up and coming teens, just planning it. I mean, to me, it was absolutely defining, as it sounds like it was to you. So anyway, you come back, you go to Durham University, and then what mm. happens? Yeah, very early on, I remember uh, being at a, a kind of church gathering, I think it was a student gathering actually, and listening to the speaker talk about the needs of the world and the unreached peoples. And I remember the stats at that time, I think he said 2% of all Christian missionaries are working in what they call the 1040 window, sometimes called today the 1040 window as well. It's um, basically, it's from Northern Africa in the far West, all the way across through the Middle East, Central Asia into Western Asia. And that's where most of the world's poor are, most of the world's unreached peoples, where the gospel hasn't really taken root, uh, where there are no churches quite often, where the gospel isn't known about. And, and it really struck me, what? This is a third of the world's population, and we're only sending 2% of our missionaries there. This makes no sense mm. at all. And I just had one of those moments where I just... You know, I think he was speaking on Isaiah 6, and it was that, who will go for me? Whom shall I send, yes. Paul? And it struck me deep in my heart, and I just responded, here I am, Lord, send me like Isaiah. And I remember, similar to your story, some, you know, I don't care how difficult it is, how dangerous it is, I just go. I'm so in love with Jesus right now, I feel so forgiven as a new Christian. Mm. I just have to share this with the world. Also, I didn't really have a place. I came from in England, my dad was in the army, so we moved and moved and moved. 
So I don't know where my home is, you know, in England at that point. So I just said, yeah, Lord, send me wherever. I'm, I'm up for this. And so he took you to Albania and Morocco? Yeah, did some short-term trips, testing the water, which I think is always a really good idea. You know, you might not be very effective on a short-term trip, but it's a great time to, to test a calling. And for me, that was huge. Yeah, a crazy time in Albania, just when communism had fallen, there were about three shops open in the capital city. And yeah, that was more sort of evangelism on the streets and, and lots of people responding. But then, of course, Morocco, very different. We were told no, no public evangelism here. We're going to learn about Islam and Muslims and pray, pray, pray for the country. And actually, the shock of that was on the first night we were on camping on the beach. We'd driven all the way from England down to Morocco in a minibus mm. with a bunch of students. It was great fun. But on the on the beach on the first night, we were sharing the gospel with Muslims and they were talking. And I just realized very soon, Muslims love to talk about God. Mm. I don't know why we've been ignoring them for centuries often with the gospel. They, yeah. they love talking about God. Sure, they're, they're set in their cultural ways and religious backgrounds, but they, they're in some ways easier to talk to than our average secular British friend. Yeah. One thing that always strikes me, by the way, when I talk to you, Matt, is how much you love Muslims. And, you know, some mm. people listening to this podcast might even have a question about, oh, isn't it even appropriate to share our faith? Mm. You know, isn't that, isn't that invading their space and, and disrespecting them? But to, I know that's absolutely not your heart. And I, I loved it. It was a brother Andrew, I think I credit to, to him anyway. Islam is spelled I-S-L-A-M. I sincerely love all Muslims. And yes. your your love absolutely shines through for, for them in general. Yes. I mean, this is it. You know, Frontiers, who I work for now, they, they have a tagline with love and respect, inviting all Muslim peoples to follow Jesus. You know, the, the basic level, this is what we want to do. We want to show them God's love. We want to be, you know, God's heart and, and hands towards them. And yeah, you know, whether you go back to the story of Jonah in scripture, there are lots and lots of reluctant sort of prophets and who are a bit scared of who they're called to go reach. I, I've never felt that, to be honest. Muslims are so friendly, so hospitable. You know, of course, there's the one or two percent who, you know, who are a bit more aggressive and antagonistic and so on. But my my overall experience after now two, two three decades working with Muslims is they're incredibly hungry and beautiful people. Okay, just... I know some people say, hang on, you just said one or two percent who are more aggressive. Statistics are higher than that, though, aren't they? Yeah, you might be right. I, I'm, I guess I'm talking anecdotally the people I've come across. If you look at the stats, the thing is, you might find in certain countries of the world, like Pakistan, where I ended up, you'll have a whole whack of people, maybe 20, 30, 40 percent, who will feel angry with the West, who will feel upset and think that the Christian West is attacking Islam yeah. and Palestine is a Christian political attack on Islam. Yeah. So there is anger and therefore there's sympathy with some of the sort of terrorist organizations who hit back at the West. And I can understand some of that, but actually face to face and anecdotally, you know, most of them are incredibly friendly and hospitable to you as a person. And it's really politicians, politics and the kind of grand scale thing. That's what they're angry about. Yes, I drove a truck from England to Kenya in 1997. We went through about six Muslim countries, and I have never received such extraordinary hospitality from, I mean, particularly in Syria, actually. Every single place we stopped, by the time we opened the bus door, the truck door, we were invited back to someone's house. It was totally overwhelming and honestly humbling for us from our culture where, you know, we're much more individualistic and frankly selfish. Yeah. So after those short-term exposures in Albania and Morocco, you ended up being focused. Your life very much revolved around Pakistan, didn't it? Yeah, that's right. I think more and more my love for South Asia and my love for Muslims started to combine. And I just couldn't get my eye off Pakistan. You know, it's just a, a country where you've got 200 million Muslims most probably, you know, 97% probably of the country are Muslim. And most of them, we estimate about, 87% of Muslims around the world have never met a follower of Jesus. So I just thought, you know, this is the place for me. It's just going to connect with my, you know, some people think missionaries are called by God with some kind of voice, which is very, very rare. You know, of the hundreds and hundreds of missionaries I met, very few have ever heard a voice from God. A calling grows in many different ways. But one of my experiences, in a sense, is that God uses the, the desires of your heart. Remember that verse in I think Psalm 37, isn't it? Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. It's not that he'll send you to the worst country in the world and the place that you would hate the most. 
that's not how God operates. He's a God of love. And he, he combines, I think, our backgrounds, our experiences and our, even our desires, some of our natural desires. Like I love cricket and I love Pakistan. And those two yeah. connect at some point in my calling. Mm -hmm. So it's a circuitous route getting there. You first of all went into teaching. Interesting enough, I met, I was speaking at an event a couple of years ago and there are four lads. And I think all of them had been in your, at your grammar school where you taught in the youth group and very much benefited from your discipling. <laughs> That's kind. I mean, this is what I love about God. There are many days, Simon, where I think, what on earth have I achieved in life? I mean, let alone practically, but spiritually too. And you think, what were those years in Pakistan for? And was the fruit long lasting? Was there any fruit? You know, I don't have these kind of major success stories of church funding movements that just were unstoppable. You know, I had a pretty difficult field to work in where we didn't see a lot mm. of fruit. And whether that's when I taught at grammar school or whether I, when I was in Pakistan, I think there are times we just doubt ourselves. And think, yeah. What was that about? And then you get snippets. So thank you for bringing things like that. Because I'm, yeah, you sometimes see something 10 years later and think, oh, wow, that, that that we did in Pakistan, that's still having an effect and still having a knock-on effect. And that's, that's something about who God is. Nothing's wasted in his kingdom. I love that. Mm. Yeah, so I was a teacher only so that I could go overseas with a valuable skill that I could use. Because in Muslim countries around the world, you know, very few people can go as a missionary, be an evangelist or a church planter. So usually we go with a skill, a business, something, a trade, and then we use that and we join a church planting team and, and we use our, our work for the glory of God. And we and of course, then we're, we're reaching out as, as best we can with the message of Jesus everywhere we go. So for me, becoming a teacher was on that journey towards teaching English in Pakistan. So my, yeah, I went out there. I did a couple of years at Bible college too, to get some extra training in sort of missiology and cultural anthropology, biblical studies and so on. Um, same college that you went to as well, Simon. And then I went out in 2002 as a long-termer to, to Pakistan. Let's give them a shout out, by the way, because they'll be annoyed at not being mentioned. So that was All Nations <laughs> Christian College. Great place if you want to get trained in mission. Yes, amen. So I had done a couple of short vision trips to Pakistan by this stage, but I, I arrived in, I think it was March or April 2002. So about six months after 9-11 had happened, I arrived in Pakistan. And there's a cr kind of crazy story from pretty much day one as I landed at the airport. Um, I was expecting to be met by a couple of my team members, but it wasn't them that arrived to pick me up at the airport. It was my team leader. And I said to him, oh, I thought the other guys were picking me up. He said, oh, well, I guess you didn't hear on the plane. No, they, they got caught up in a terror attack yesterday oh, at the International Church in Islamabad. And that was a bit of a shock, stepping off the aeroplane. Crikey, if I'd been there one day earlier, probably would have been in that terror attack. So some guys had walked into the Protestant International Church in Islamabad and they'd rolled grenades just into the church. Um, and it was terrible. I mean, you know, five, five or six people died that day. Thankfully, my two team members um, got away with their lives. They, but when I first met them that day, uh, they had perforated eardrums, you know, some scarring up and down their arms a little bit, but they were basically okay. But real shock to the, yeah, the Christian community and the international Christian community. Mm. And actually that set off, sparked off, uh, about six months, every single month in my first six months in Pakistan, there was an attack on foreigners. Some French naval engineers in Karachi, Taxila Christian Hospital, another big one was Murray Christian School. And I'd been up in Murray in the lower Himalayas, learning my language, getting into Urdu. Um, and there were very few of us up there, actually, that summer because of 9-11 and many of the foreigners had left. So the whole kind of missionary community had dwindled big time when I had arrived that spring. Um, but a few were trickling back in and the school had reopened and then... Uh, yeah, just so sad that in August of that year, they were also attacked by some gunmen who'd been waiting for two months in the village, waiting to go in the school and just open fire. They had bags of guns with them and other weapons. Um, so, yeah, it was, a, it was a shocking start. I mean, I've got some crazy miracle stories in it that, that happened on that day, too. Um, but, it, yeah, it was a shocking kind of start in some ways. Got my prayer supporters praying, I'm sure. All right, well, go on, yeah. share those stories. Um, yeah, so... The crazy thing is, although the terrorists had been preparing, sitting for two months, working out when to get into the school, meanwhile, the school had been building up walls, 10-foot walls, because of these first attacks in April of that year. They thought, yeah, we better be wise as well as trust the Lord and build some walls, put some guards around, um, you know, armed guards on the front of the school. Um, but even so, when the, the gunmen ran in and they, they shot dead, I think, five again, five or six of the Pakistani staff, so sad. Um, 
one of the, the Christian members of staff I'd been playing cricket with a few weeks before. His name was Babur. Um, and they came in, he was on reception, they shot him dead. But when they got into the school proper, through the gates and so on, having killed a few people, they couldn't find anyone else in the school. I mean, mm. they were looking everywhere. They kicked at doors. If they'd pulled those doors, they would have opened. All the kids, because of the gunfire, had gone into lockdown, dived under desks, shut their classroom doors as best they could. Staff members had hidden in toilets. Wherever they could find, people were scattering and hiding. Mm. And the terrorists were so confused because they planned to arrive at break time when everyone would be outside on the playground. And it started raining 10 minutes before they arrived. Wow. And so the one class that would, and they got it wrong, they got the timings of break wrong for some reason. Otherwise, everyone would have been outside. But the one class that was outside on the playground playing basketball for, for their class time, it had started raining. And so they'd gone in as well. So when the terrorists actually came in, they couldn't find anyone. And they were aiming for the foreigners, of course, couldn't see a single foreigner. They were really confused. They thought this is a trap. We've been set up. And so they panicked and they basically dropped their weapons and fled. And they, they headed off into the Kashmir forests and the army caught up with them a few hours later and, and nabbed them all. Um, but some of the miracles that happened, all the kids, many, many of the kids, they wrote, a, well, the whole school, they, they kind of combined and wrote a book later called Angels in the Rafters, because many of the kids were hiding under their desks while the attack was going on and they could hear singing up in the rooftops. Oh, above. man. So many different kids had testified to this afterwards. I've got another, goosebumps, got goosebumps yeah, all over me. I now. know. It's crazy. I spoke to a lady. So I, I also went in the next day. I mean, you know, I wasn't at that school. I was in a nearby property doing my language learning. But I went down to help the kids and just hang out with them the next day after the attack. And one of the mothers, all the parents were coming in from across Pakistan. One of the mothers, Filipino lady, she stood with me and showed me all the bullet holes in the wall behind her. She was one of the few foreigners, I think the only one actually, who was caught outside because she was visiting the school that day to see her kids. The gunman saw her, he looked at her, he just opened fire with his automatic weapon. Bullets went through her hair, flying past her body. She said, I, I don't know how, they all missed me. And then finally one just clipped her hand and she you know, just touched her hand and she, she, got, she was like, ow, and then somebody came out from a door, grabbed her and pulled her inside and and she got away with her life and the, th the third story i remember vividly is um there was a muslim cook who worked at the school and he he was caught outside and he got stuck by the outside wall this new 10-foot wall and he couldn't escape and suddenly he felt himself yanked he went up he went over the wall landed with a crunch on the other side out in the forest hmm. turned around to say ow but thank you and there was no one there if you're enjoying this podcast, why not give us a five-star rating so that more folks can hear these inspiring stories and join us in praying, sending, giving and going. He went up, he went over the wall, landed with a crunch on the other side out in the forest. Hmm. Turned around to say, ow, but thank you. And there was no one there at all. Wow. <laughs> and he just, you know, just these kind of stories were coming out of that day. I mean, I felt, Talk about the hairs on the back of your neck. I mean, Simon, when I walked into that school the following day, I'm not I'm not a sensory person in spiritual realms. I don't kind of sense evil or that, but I gosh, I've never felt like I was on holy ground more than when I walked in the next day. It's crazy. Wow. Mm. I I think uh, in Burundi we just had one occasion when we'd been told that Al Shabaab militants, you know, Somali linked, were mm. gonna come to the school, or there was chitter chatter picked up by CIA or whatever. So we were all warned to stay away and it's a very weird place to a situation to find oneself in, isn't it? With all those yeah. parents who are serving the Lord wherever they were, and yes. I praise God for His intervention. Yeah, definitely. So, you spent three years, didn't you, living with a Pakistani family, so learning yes. Urdu and and culture? Yeah, that was a great experience. I mean, that, in some ways, those those were the slowest years of my my time in Pakistan because you know you're just digging into language and culture, language and culture four hours a day with a private tutor for, for three years. And gosh, you know, I was sick of the side of him. He was probably sick of the side of me. Brilliant teacher. Um, but what a privilege to go deep into language. And I think that's so valuable if you're going to show God's love. And if you're going to enjoy and thrive in a culture like that, you, you've got to go deep into language and culture, as you know. I mean, you, you, you get all that. Um, but yeah, I loved that. And I loved being a student down there. Um, I did also join in the university with some classes. So got to know some young students down there. But yeah, basically, that was my kind of preparation three years down country, learning, also learning kind of Pakistani Christian culture, mm -hmm. as well as the, the major Islamic culture surrounding 
um, before I went up into the mountains. So that was preparation time for 2005 moving. Was it three years in the end that you were teaching English up there? In the yeah, probably. I think it was three years before I got married. And then uh, when we came back married, we had another year before we were expelled. So probably, yeah, probably about seven years altogether. Six mm-hmm. years of those, I was a single guy. Yeah. And then this major earthquake hit, 70,000 mm. odd people killed. Yeah. Were you caught in that? Um, I felt it definitely. I was, I, I'd quite recently moved into my house up in the mountains where the team were based, the church planting team. And yeah, I got this job teaching at the university there and very excited. It was all just starting for me. This is the dream. This is where I've been wanting to get to. And I think it was my first month up there. I was sitting in the garden, reading the scriptures, praying, and suddenly the earth begins to shake. And I thought, oh no, everything went really quiet. I don't know if you've ever been in an earthquake mm-hmm. time, but all the birds kind of went quiet yeah, and it yeah. was eerie. And I was like, what's going on? And then the, the ground was shaking for about 30 seconds where I was, a lot longer down country. Um, and I saw some sort of smoke up on the mountain or dust up on the mountains as some a rock slide started. And I thought, oh, Lord, please don't let my house be flattened. I literally just moved into this place. Um, but no, where we were 16 hours north of the epicenter. So to be honest, there wasn't a lot of damage in my town. Uh, but very soon after that, my, my boss came to me, my team leader, and said, Matt, we, we've got to go down. We've got to go down and help with this earthquake relief. I said, but come on, man, we're, we're like a long-term community development organization up here, and I've just got this job at the university. Really? We're going to go down country into the Northwest Frontier province and, and work in earthquake relief? That's not really our expertise. And he said, come on, Matt, we've been praying for those areas where, you know, these sort of AK-47 wielding parts of Pakistan in the Northwest Frontier, where there are no workers, no gospel outreach, no chance for people to hear about Jesus. He said, you know, we've been praying for those areas for years as we drive through there on the way up here to the mountains come on let's go down we've got language we've got culture i've got a friend who's designed these amazing earthquake um sort of shelters you know for when people have lost their houses and you can just really quickly build these strong shelters way better than tents that the ngos were giving out at that time in the first couple of weeks so you know within half an hour i was like yeah you're right come on let's do it let's go down there so we started a big earthquake relief program and I think we built about 7,000 shelters in about three or four months with some, a couple of partner NGOs that we taught how to um, build them as well. But that was a crazy time. So mm. We were so out of our depth, honestly, but God showed up and, yeah, in so many ways. Wonderful. And as we have experienced lockdown over the last year, you've experienced a different kind of lockdown, haven't you? Yes, that was one of the other challenges of living up in the mountain town where we were living um, was that they had quite a bit of sectarian violence and history of that since the 80s. And so, again, it wasn't long after I'd started teaching at the university when suddenly there was gunfire in the town and the, and the university just shut down quickly. They sent all the students and teachers home and very quickly the army took over the town. It was kind of a garrison town up there, a lot of army presence because it's near the borders. Um, and so they shut down the town very fast as soon as any Sunni Shia fighting erupted. And basically lockdown in in those days, for me, lockdown meant you're in your house, you rely on the provisions you've got stored up. It might be one day, two days, one week, you're not quite sure, but they're just going to lock down the town until they feel comfortable um, opening it up again. And they would have people coming out, the army trucks would go around and on their kind of loudspeaker things, they'd be shouting out, if anyone comes out of your house, you will be shot dead. So it's a good job I learned my Urdu down country, otherwise... (laughs) I wouldn't have known what was going on. Yeah, seriously. Um, but yeah, no, thankfully, I mean, I was all right. We had already stored up provisions in case of things like this happening in the house. Um, but yeah, that was that was so sad, you know, to be in a town where the violence erupted. I didn't feel under any personal threat. You know, it wasn't targeted against us as foreigners, to be honest. But yeah, that that was it was something. I mean, one funny story that came out of that was this was around that time about should we get involved with the earthquake or not. And we'd made the decision, yes, let's go down country and get involved with the earthquake. Well, I was now suddenly in lockdown. I couldn't go down and join, even though I wanted to. So we called up the chief of police and said, look, can you come and escort us out of town? We're, you know, we're foreigners and we're stuck here. We want to go down to help with the earthquake. That's where it's all happening now. Um, and of course, you get the kind of kind of answer. Yes, yes, no problem. You know, we'll come get you. You have no idea what if they will. But I went to my gate one day and when the army guys were coming around and with their loudspeakers and so on and I thought okay well actually this one this one doesn't have a loudspeaker he's not shouting it's just a truck with some army people so I stepped out of my front gate thinking maybe they've come to escort us 
<laughs> and the guy yelled at me and they turned their huge truck oh. sort of massive machine gun at me <laughs> and started yelling at me get back inside your house and i was like okay all right you are not my escort out of town <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, I was wearing Western clothes, you know, deliberately to make sure they didn't think I was a local who's being cheeky. Right. I I do remember we had various seasons of, what's it called, curfews, and if you didn't respect them, you'd get arrested. So I remember just a few times. I know this is confession time; this is a bit naughty, but I had my <laughs> tear front mates living about six hundred yards away, and I'd duck and dive behind in the shadows behind trees at midnight, coming back from a game of risk, <laughs> and uh, never got caught. But uh, I mean, it's not it's not making light of it, is it? But it's it's interesting when you're exposed to incredible danger you yeah. you you need humor you need all sorts yeah. of sort of different engagement and emotions don't you to get through because it's so utterly heavy yeah there are times i mean i've got kind of several mottos for how to live in a country like pakistan and thrive but one of them is um laugh otherwise you'll cry yeah and obviously in in the midst of the, there are times when you need to cry and it's appropriate to cry but there are times when, especially in hindsight, you can look back and, and laugh at mm. some aspect of it. Yeah. So thus far, you've just been single, Matt, but eventually you found some lady crazy enough to join up with you. Yeah, absolutely. Gosh, I mean, Jess, what a blessing. She's the greatest gift God's given to me. Just a woman who's so like brave. I mean, she was doing this already. She'd moved out to Indonesia as a single. She's from California. She was in Indonesia. We met in Thailand. We got married in Malaysia by the end of the year because God had spoken so powerfully to me. I'd only be, met, I, I mean, I'd met her what, a few months earlier. We'd only spent three weeks in person together. Wow. So it was a little bit crazy. It was a bit like blind date. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, you know, we have a lot of arranged marriages out in Pakistan. And like we always tell our friends, yeah, God arranged our marriage. Yeah. Um, and we just had to trust him. We didn't know each other very well. But wow, what a, what a cracker. Yeah, she's such a compassionate brave sharp and uh, brilliant person she's taught me so much wonderful now i cannot imagine as a burundian i mean I, i've now got citizenship uh, spent 20 years mm. there if i was told that i had to leave if i was kicked out which now they couldn't because i've got a passport they just stick me in prison but if i pre getting the passport i've been forced out kicked out for good i would have been absolutely gutted and so i think i can kind of empathize imagine what you went through when you were kicked out of pakistan talk us through that yeah it's um it's funny i don't think about it much but um i, I start choking up when i'm sometimes you know asked to talk about it um it's very hard i mean you spend years of your life you know you're committing into language and culture you've got this dream you're going to be there long term and give your life you know and the best years of your life for the gospel in a country like that and yet you're at the mercy of any government or anything else that happens and you just don't know. And you've got to hold it lightly. And, and unfortunately, having got married, spent a couple of years back in the UK and, and in the USA, we managed to then go again as a family with our three month old baby. We went out to North Pakistan um, and Jess was you know, doing such a good job adjusting to life up in a, a small town in the mountains with all the usual problems of electricity and water and other things, terrible roads. Um, and I feel like we were just adjusting to that first year of being married up there. And then suddenly just get a letter saying, you've got to leave. You've got 10 days to leave. And it's, it is, it's so frustrating and so gutting. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you don't know what to do about it. You can't really, you just pray and say, what is this? Is this, is this Satan? Is this God's sovereign will? Is this like, are we not cut out for this? What, what is going on? Should we fight it? Should we go to the law courts? Do we just take it for now and try and get back in later? But yeah, super frustrating for sure. Do they give a reason in the end? Um, there were a bunch of sort of things mentioned in the letter, um, which, which were a little bit strange and didn't make a lot of sense. But but to be honest, my best guess is this: um, it could, because we we weren't the only ones. By the end of that year, all sorts of people had been expelled from Pakistan. Not just Christian workers, missionaries, not just NGO workers, but uh, all sorts of foreigners were kicked out and and i'm pretty sure the reason is this there was a cia guy earlier that year um in february that year called raymond davis and he shot dead a couple of people in broad daylight in in the city of lahore i don't know what happened to him he just freaked out jumped off his jumped out of his car shot dead these two people following him on a motorbike a crowd gathered of course really angry a rescue car came from the u.s embassy which also killed someone as it sped through the streets to get him 
So, of course, I mean, just, you know, there's, there's a bit of a story around that and what happened to him. But basically, he was on a business visa. He was not registered CIA with the government. He wasn't working with the Pakistani government. So he was just on a business visa. And they had they came under immense pressure as a government. And I, I understand totally why they just swept out a lot of us who are on business visas mm-hmm. working in Pakistan to, to save face, to answer the opposition in government, I suppose. So really frustrating. I feel we just got caught up in international politics and it was nothing we had done. They knew we were believers. They, they know we love the Lord. It was nothing like that. You know, some of us were quite bold about our faith in a very gentle way. Um, but there was nothing that was surprising to them. It's just just really sad. I think we just got caught up in politics. And did people that you were working with think you were just jumping ship and abandoning them? Um, I... I don't think so. I think, you know, most of our friends, we got the chance. We did get, you know, a week to just sort of see most of our friends before we left. Thank God. At least we had a little bit of closure in that sense. And I, and I, I managed to get back in about six months later, just on my own. I went back from England to Pakistan on a different visa just to pack up the house because we left in a hurry. Um, so I was allowed in. I'm not blacklisted in Pakistan, which is great. But we, yeah, I, I mean, our friends understood. We just said, look, this is what happened and they get it. They, I mean, the, most of our friends are pretty poor and powerless and there's nothing they can do when the government say this or say that or yeah. lockdown happens on their town. And, mm. you know, they, they get it. They're just at the mercy of higher authorities and they have no no say. And was this about the time Osama bin Laden was killed? Yeah. Ironically, we got our letter from the government. I mean, it was, you know, backdated, so it's not at all connected, but we happened to receive our letter um of eviction basically from the country expulsion on the same day osama bin laden was assassinated oh, executed wow. by the american government and and the funny thing is simon we were down country so i'd gone down to some we were on a, on a spiritual retreat actually with some other workers and we got our notification i was like no but you know we've got it we had to get back up to the mountains which is quite an effort and sometimes can take you days going through the landslides or trying to get a flight that sometimes just turns around again because of the clouds around the mountains anyway we had to get back up north and tell all our friends we're leaving and, and we've got to go. And it just felt like, oh no, they're going to say to us, we've been telling you for years you're CIA and now you've gone down oh, country. Dear. Osama bin Laden's been taken out. You're coming back up, packing and going home. Ah, oh, come on. So, mm. you know, it's, it's crazy when people ask you, are you CIA? It's kind of a <laughs> ridiculous question, but it was really frustrating. Mm. Yeah. And I'm guessing there must have been some really dark times as you struggled to adjust to a new chapter that you hadn't chosen for yourself. Yes. Yeah, definitely. You know, you ask a lot of questions of God and of each other and yourself. Um, and we wrestled with it. We were sort of stuck in London for a year or two, probably perhaps a year, year and a half wrestling with that. Can we, I mean, I had a visa application ready to go back again. We were just going to try and go back to the capital, start again down there, at least a bit more in the government's eyes. Perhaps they would you know, feel OK about that. But yeah, I don't know. You know, one day Jess just sat, sat with me and having coffee and said, Matt, if this is God, we go. I don't care how dangerous it is, whatever. You know, this is our life. This is what we're called to. If this is God, we'll do it. And she was by this time pregnant with number two. And she said, if this is just my mummy hormones, like making me get nervous, just tell me, No, you know, we'll push through this. Um, but I said, you know what, honey, I've, I've had this hesitation in my spirit for, for a few months now. I'm not sure we're supposed to be going back. And she was like, what? You ne- what? That's not you, Matt. You just, you love Pakistan. This is your, your life's journey. And, yeah, but as we started talking about that, we actually felt, you know what, maybe the Lord's releasing us right now. Um, and so that began the beginning of feeling called actually to a UK-based ministry, working amongst Muslims here now in the UK. And we're in a small town in the UK here with about 30,000 Pakistani Muslims. Mm-hmm. And we just love connecting with the community here and doing our best to share the gospel with with them and, and show them Jesus in, in this location. I mean, I, you know, we still miss being overseas in many ways. Um, but but that's a great thing that the Lord has called us into. And, and now, of course, I'm, my my other work is, is mobilizing Four Frontiers UK. And I, I, I didn't know what a mobilizer was, but I found out I love it. I love telling people about the Great Commission. I love telling people about the unreached peoples and, and how we, we've got so much more to do for a third of the world that's never heard the gospel to actually hear. OK, so what would be your mobilizer pitch? Let's say you've got two minutes to blast us right now. And you, I, know, I know your passion, your heartbeat. So just go for it. <laughs> Okay, uh, there's a big problem, um, and especially as we look at the Muslim world, there's 1.8 billion Muslims worldwide. And if 
nine out of 10 of them eight, nine out of 10 of them have never met a follower of Jesus, then surely this is a, a stain on, on the life of the church and the mission of the church. And, you know, we believe it, it breaks God's heart that, that so many millions, tens of millions, even hundreds of millions have not had the gospel yet. Yes, of course, Europe needs re-evangelizing. Yes, this country, the UK has got problems, but there are good churches everywhere in this country and even across Europe. And yet there are places still in the world today, not just remote tribes in a tiny, tiny jungle somewhere, but we're talking mega cities and whole countries where still hardly, you know, just so few people have heard the gospel. So we long to raise up people to go long term to serve in the Muslim world, especially um, but among unreached peoples where the gospel's never gone and to be willing to lay their lives down for this, for Jesus' glory. You know, he's worth it all. His name is worth it. And unfortunately, you know, other gods are still served today in so many places. And, and that, I think, breaks God's heart. So you go around universities trying to mobilize people, churches, whoever will have you, conferences. I saw you speaking at New Wine a couple of years ago. Um, some people will say you're just exporting colonialism, that sort of accusation. Can you refute that? Yeah, that is, I think it is a concern. It's a genuine concern. And it, especially young people today, I think there's a loss of confidence in the gospel. And of course, a lot of the pluralism that's being taught in schools these days has made people a little worried about proclaiming Jesus and being confident about the uniqueness of Christ. But you know what? To answer the colonial question, first of all, there's no such, I mean, missions these days. Mission is not to do with the West to the rest. You know, we're Frontiers, for example, one of many mission agencies, but we are not a West to the rest organization. We have about 1,400, 1,500 field workers in Muslim countries, about 40 or 50 Muslim countries around the world. Many of our workers are from Korea. They're from China. Uh, they're from sub-Saharan Africa, even Latin America. You know, we have sending bases all over the world, sending people into unreached places. And that's the beauty of it. This is not a colonial thing. This is a Middle Eastern savior that we follow. This is a gospel that is, is universal. And it doesn't matter who mm. the messenger is. We've got to take the gospel out. We are the church. We are the global church. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. It just matters, you know, where are we going to? Can we take the gospel to places where, where it hasn't been? I think that's so important. And then the second thing is, uh, what is our message? Is it a colonial West is best message? No, absolutely not. I know plenty of problems with Western culture. I'm not yeah. going there to preach Western culture, Western Christianity, Western church. No, thanks. I don't want to go plant Western churches anywhere. When we talk about church planting, we're not talking about buildings or denominations from over here. Forget that. We're talking about people following Jesus, gathering in groups, reading his word, singing to him, worshiping him loving him, obeying him, and sharing that message with others. And so church planting movements can start. And that's the beautiful thing about church planting. Wherever you're coming from, um, that's, that's it. It's not a colonial thing. Our message is not Christianity. Our message is Jesus. And even his message was not, let's start a new religion. It was the kingdom of God. How can we be close to God? Amen. Now, you're clearly trying to get people to leave this nation and go to the nations. But meantime so many people groups muslims have come to this nation and a lot of us will know we'll have muslim neighbors and muslim colleagues and yet there's a real reticence in many in terms of reaching out to them what would you say and how can people be more effective yeah thanks that's a great question yeah i praise god i really do praise god that there are many cultures that have come to our shores and, and god is behind that he's sovereign um, and that's a wonderful thing. Whatever you think about the politics of immigration, let's praise God for those who are here. Let's have soft hearts and welcoming hearts. And that's that is part of the gospel. Yes, let's reach out. Even in the UK, we have such opportunities here. There are so many people who know Jesus here. We have the opportunity. What if every Christian had one Muslim friend? Mm. And, you know, what if when we went to the petrol station, we didn't ignore the guy behind the counter or when we go to the, the superstore or Tesco or Morrison's, whatever, we actually have a little conversation at the checkout. These are beautiful people. God loves them. And they often are on the back foot and they don't feel very welcome here. And I think it's our job as a church to show that Jesus loves them, whoever they are. We're called to love our neighbor. We're called to love our enemies, even if even if there are such things as enemies, which I don't think there are really. You know, we have spiritual enemies. We don't have physical enemies as people of God. Yeah. But even if we had a physical enemy, we're called to love them. Mm. So there's really no excuse. And, and I just think, you know, guys, make a friend. That's what this is about. Show, just show a welcoming heart and be willing to talk faith because they love talking faith. It's easier to talk faith with them. Yes, so be aware, open your eyes and, 
and also don't preach Christianity, but speak about Jesus, share your testimony. That's that's the key thing, I think, with, with Muslims in this country. Yeah, I've got a friend, Linda, in Ealing, and I'm guessing she's about 60. She's not a theologian. She hasn't got all the answers, but she has got a massive heart. And she she doesn't quite literally, but she kind of literally goes up to these typically young men, Muslim men on the streets, and just almost hugs them straight away. But, you know, just comes alongside. She's not inappropriate, but she she is yeah. so able to get alongside them, give them a hug, and invariably, they're, you know, they're separated from their family, and she has seen loads of fruit because these wow. people are just gagging for relationship and acceptance, and particularly from us nationals, us Brits, because we're invariably very cold, aren't we? So it's so easy on this level to be countercultural. Yes, definitely. I mean, I want to give a quick shout out to Welcome Churches. If your church would even consider looking out for refugees, caring for refugees, you know, have a look at look up Welcome Churches. They're brilliant. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, Mahaba is a group I'm connected with. We pray for Muslims and reach out to Muslims. They, they've got a network right across the UK and beyond. Um, but yeah, Frontiers, technically we don't work in the UK uh, because we're, we, we want to focus all our energy, resources, attention on the unreached peoples where there is no church. Um, that's our passion. But personally, of course, I'm here. I've got Muslims around me and I love that. I just want to be salt and light for them. Thanks so much for listening. I hope today's episode has been inspiring and challenging. For more, check us out on our website frontiers.org.uk and on all social media platforms at Frontiers UK. Have a great week and make sure you don't miss our next episode.